Will you please pray with me? God, we ask that it is you that we hear and feel in these words and in this place. Please fill us and inspire us to want to go and share you. Amen. It's been a while, right, since I've been up here? Seems like a long time. We had a great message last week from Jessica that was amazing. You can watch it online. You can go to our website. You can see it. You can relive it as many times as you'd like. You can share it with all of your family. But it's all up there. Uh, it was great. So it's been a while for me, so I thought to get started, I'd like to share with you an amazing story I read online recently by a poster named Goose, 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 Goose. You know it's going to be good if that's the handle that they're writing with, right? This is what she writes. I had just moved into a newly constructed home, and all my belongings had been packed, moved, and unloaded by a contracted mover. After an entire day of moving and unpacking and trying to organize, my husband and I were beat. We decided to fall asleep and start again the following day. Sometime around midnight, I woke, I woke up with a headache and a pain in my ear. My husband was still a little drowsy as I woke him up and asked him if he could take a look at it. Can you see anything, I asked. There's a spider in your ear, he answered calmly. What? Haha, <laughs> yeah, right. Seriously, do I have an ear infection or something? He simply repeated himself. You have a spider in your ear. What? Seriously? At this point, I became more aware of the pain, pressure, and fullness in my ear. Get it out! Get it out! My husband runs to the bathroom and grabs a Q-tip. He sits down and proceeds to poke at my ear. This is where everything goes awry. That thing started wriggling to get deeper into my ear. I hear a loud whoosh, whoosh, whoosh sound, and the pain increases tenfold. I'm now utterly panicked and crippled with pain. The angry ear invader stops scratching, and I tell my husband to get the tweezers, and I curl into the fetal position on the bed. He comes back and starts his extraction. He reaches in, and I feel the bugs start to get very active, and then suddenly starts clawing deeper into my ear. I pulled off its leg. He says coolly. At least I think that's what he said. I'm deafened by the sound of this horrifying creature now tearing its way into the deepest recesses of my inner ear, crippled by the pain inside my head over my own screaming and crying. I look down at the disembodied leg. It's not a spider leg. It's a cockroach leg. I have a meltdown. A cockroach is a million times worse than a spider. I jump up and run to the bathroom screaming and slamming my hand into my other ear, trying to shake it out. My husband pushes me over to the sink and shoves my head under the faucet, trying to flush it out, but every millimeter of space in my ear is full of horrific cockroach. I finally tell my husband to call 911. I go to the hospital where they kill the bug because they can't pull it out, give me some pain meds and send me home until I can see an ENT in the morning. I go home and can't sleep, even with the tranquilizer they shot me full of. My mind is racing, thinking about the partial roach corpse languishing in my sinus cavity. The second the ENT opened in the morning, I was there. Feeling him pull that thing out was the single most satisfying and horrifying moment of my life. He removed it in nearly one piece, and he said it was the largest insect he had ever seen in an ear. It was about an inch long and three quarters of an inch wide. It had destroyed my tympanic membrane brain and broke the bones in my ear. It's been a while and I still have problems with that ear. I also still sleep with earplugs. It is likely that the rat crawled into our belongings from the moving truck. I guess they love cardboard. What a crazy story. I hope that never happens to me or anyone in my house, or anyone I know, or anyone ever. It gives me the creeps, and judging by your faces, I'd say it probably gave most of you the creeps as well. However, having a bug in your ear does do one thing, and that one thing is it gets your immediate attention. There's no putting it off. It gets you right away. There's no ignoring it. It's like when you hear a painful truth. It stings. 
Something you know is true and requires your attention, but it means you'll have to go out of your way to follow through. Hopefully by this point in the story, we do have a bug in our ear. Hopefully God's story has gotten our full attention and we have been brought in so that we can hear and see where God is taking us. The goal of any church in going through the story has been to have the people say, maybe for the first time, that you really understand what the story of the Bible is all about. Because the Bible can be overwhelming. It's ancient. Its 66 books are not organized chronologically, but topically. It contains odd customs like animal sacrifices and funny names like Zerubbabel, Jehoshaphat, Jeroboam, Rehoboam, and more. All those names that we struggled with in Sunday school. All those people and places that we had a hard time remembering. When we started the story, I opened up Adult Sunday School by asking for anybody to tell us the story of the Bible in three minutes or less. Nobody readily volunteered, and one finally tried. But our goal should be for all of us to know God's story well enough that we can communicate in three minutes or less the whole story or the essence of the Bible, the essence of God's story. The back of your sheet today might help you. There, if you get your little insert out. You've had a whole week to look this over too to try to figure it out. There on this sheet we can see that in Genesis 1 through 2, this this portion of the story reveals God's original vision and that is simply to be with us. God creates us so that we can all be together. The community of God, and we say community of God because the word for God in the creation story is plural. The community of God wants to extend their community to include the community of people, to include all of humanity, to include us. In Genesis 3, we see that the original people, our representatives, choose a different vision than God's vision, and they are separated from God, and in the process, separated from each other too. A sin DNA is injected into our being, into our souls at this point, and it's transferred on to our progeny. It's passed down generation to generation so that every person in this room has it with them. We all carry with us our sinful nature. And it separates us from God. At the bottom of that chart, you can see that the rest of the story is not all that complicated. Every chapter, every page tells the extent God will go in order to get us back. In Sunday school, we kept asking the question, why aren't they listening? I'd have to keep rephrasing it and saying, we're still that way today. Why aren't we listening? God tries again and again and again to redeem the people. God wants to recapture that original vision to be with us, but our sin must be dealt with. In that verse, that oh-so-popular verse in the middle of that cross reveals what God does to get us all back. God offers up the life and blood of his only son so that we may be forgiven so that we all may be forgiven. Genesis 12 is when God starts a new nation called Israel. And from there to the end of the Old Testament in Malachi, God works with and through this nation of Israel. He uses Israel to reveal himself to them and to all nations and uses the tribe of Judah to provide the Messiah, the Redeemer, the Deliverer, Jesus who will give us the way back into relationship with God. Everything in the story we've been reading to this point, in our faith, everything is pointing toward this first coming of Jesus. After Jesus finishes his work on the cross, God turns his attention to the second primary relationship, and that's the church. The first was Israel, and the second is the church And that's where we intersect with this story in our lives. 
everything that the church does points not to that first coming of Christ. That's meant to inspire us so that we do things that point to that second coming, things that point to God's kingdom. Because at that second coming, God's vision is restored and we can be a part of the new community that God is going to establish on earth, which fulfills God's vision from the very beginning, which is a kingdom where we live with God. That's why we're going through the story. So that we can see this big picture in this week, in this moment, we are right before the cross. Well, 400 years before it, but in the big scheme of things, right before it. And we read about Ezra, Nehemiah, and Malachi. These are the last people and prophet that we have written about in the Old Testament. And they've been tasked with the rebuilding of Jerusalem and its walls. The temple has been built and now the city must be fortified. But as with all of our other stories, our human sin nature gets in the way. Others try to stop the rebuilding. And even some of the builders themselves get tired and say, there's no way this can be done before our enemies come in and destroy us. If we take a step back and think about this story, it seems kind of backwards, doesn't it? Why would you spend all this time and money to build this wonderful and magnificent temple in a city that is in ruins with no fortifications, no wall to protect it? Why would you put all that energy in something that isn't necessarily safe? There's a larger story at play here. God loves each and every one of us as we are and for who we are. We all are called to serve. We all are asked to accept Christ as our Lord and Savior. We are all forgiven. Every one of us here, whether this is our first time in church or if we've been doing this for 80 plus years, we are all accepted by God and we can all take this moment to invite Christ into our lives. We all come here to celebrate God together and know that we are loved. But does that mean that we will always be Christ-centered? I've come to find out as a married adult that for Tara and I, it is easy to become parents. But just doing that part, just making a child, does not prepare you for being a parent. You go to classes. You pack a bag for when you go to the hospital. You go through the whole ordeal of having a child. And every day, you learn something new about yourself, and about your child. Just making the child does not prepare you for being a parent. There's so much other work that must go into it. And for some people, they do all that other work without necessarily having their own child, and they're wonderful, amazing parents. So you don't necessarily have to have the child to be a parent. But the child alone does not make you a parent. Though we can each say that we are Christ followers, though we can say those words, though we can sing those songs, though we can read this scripture, though we can all know that we are God's temple, our lives are not fortified to withstand the onslaught of sin, desire, temptation, and more that surrounds us in this world. Many of us haven't put in the work necessary to rebuild our walls that have crumbled again and again at the beckoning of sin. It takes more than just those words to live a kingdom life. The end of what we call the Old Testament is a foreshadowing of not only God's presence coming to dwell with us in the form of the 
Jeremiah, but also that God will not leave us, but help us fortify our lives so that we might become a part of this grand upper story where all of humanity is redeemed back to God. They built the temple first because God protects the temple and helps them fortify the city. God will and does help us protect ourselves from sin. And we need God's presence with us because we aren't too different than the people who found themselves in Jerusalem rebuilding those walls. As we read on the story, page 302 in Malachi chapter 3, 7 through 15, some of these should sound familiar. We can read, Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. You have spoken arrogantly against me, says the Lord. And you ask, what have we said against you? You have said it is futile to serve God. What do we gain by carrying out his requirements and going about like mourners before the Lord Almighty? But now we call the arrogant blessed. Certainly evildoers prosper, and even when they put God to the test, they get away with it. What a lot of complainers, right? You don't want to say yes because you realize this sounds so much like us. We continue to rob from God. We continue to speak against God. And we continue to take credit ourselves for the blessings in our lives. So God's had enough. And a new way is coming. And that new way is pointed out very clearly at the end of our chapter and at the very end of Malachi and at the very end of what we call the Old Testament. This is the end of that section of Scripture before we get to the Gospels. And it reads like this. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. A prophet in the line of Elijah is coming. A prophet whom we must listen to or God will have to find another way. And so John the Baptist comes to prepare the way for the Messiah. And that Messiah is, oh, I'm so glad people know. That Messiah is Jesus, and we are going to be celebrating his arrival next week. We've been building up to this moment since January 11th. This is months in the making. We've been preparing ourselves, but take this week to prepare yourself to meet the Messiah again. Because he is coming. And as a church, we should be pointing toward his arrival. Amen.